And what I'm now going to do is share my screen and share. And I rather hope I'm screen sharing. And now we're going to play ah, some thoughts on FES. And that is Camilla operating in Auckland. And so I hope that most of what I say um, <laughs> will, will be a fair reflection. You can tell me if I'm making anything up, Camilla, um, that this is how indeed I hope I do it. So look, I think the absolutely first question to ask is when to operate. And it's really easy because you operate after medical therapy has failed. Medical therapy is straightforward because we've only got a really very small number of options. We have topical steroid sprays, systemic steroids, antibiotics, and saline. And once we've given an adequate trial of that and the patient's not well, then what more do we have to offer? We have sinus surgery. But how do you determine when medical therapy has failed? That's not actually the easiest of questions to answer. You can look whether patient symptoms have got better, whether their endoscopy has got better, or whether their sinus CT scan has improved, maybe. But really, at the end of the day, the only thing which is important is how the patients feel. So I think symptoms are of primary importance. How do you determine symptoms with sinus scores? And here's the one that PJ uses in Adelaide. It's really simple, five things that you um, do a little visual analog scale for. Um, here's the SNOP22, obviously much more difficult to complete. However, um, in its way, much better, much better validated uh, and really helpful and can be done on iPads electronically. And this is the one that I must confess I based most of my um, surgery on. Now, um, so how do you do it? Um, Gestalt. Gestalt is clearly a German word. It's a psychological term, and, I, and it's really good, I reckon, for patients and their management. It is that the mind forms a global whole with self-organizing tendencies. Good Lord. So what you really do, I mean, the reality is, is there's no one particular number or impression. It is a global perspective of whether the patient's got better and it involves symptom scores, how miserable they tell you they tell you are, how much medication they have to use to stay okay. And I think there's absolutely no doubt that it surgery, you lower it so that um, you are more likely to operate because operating for patients with asthma improves their asthma. So what's the extent of surgery? Um, I, I have it in my mind in a, a very simple way. You can either do a mini fess, a comprehensive or full house fess, or a frontal sinus drill out. If it's limited disease or disease limited to the osteomeatal unit, then you do a middle meatal entrostomy and probably not much more. And if it is more extensive, then they get a middle meatal entrostomy, a frontal recess dissection, a sphenoethmoidectomy. And if they have recurrent frontal disease, they get a, a drill out. So look, that is a preamble general thoughts about a process which is hard to make absolutely clear, but which I think can be simplified into a small number of uh, simple dichotomies. So what about the anatomy, which, you know, is, is the meaning of everything? Um, what I'd like to do now is just very briefly summarize, present a few thoughts about how I think about the anatomy of the frontal recess. And I think the key is the answer in it, which wraps around a space, a volume to form the cell of the agonizi or mound of the nose. And if you draw a cartoon of what that CT scan was demonstrating, you have the left orbit, the uncinate, the space of the agonizing cell, 
the middle turbinate, and the frontal recess and ostium. Now, in some patients, as, you, as you're very aware, sometimes the unsinate doesn't swing all the way laterally to attach to the lamina. In some patients, it attaches to the skull base or the middle turbinate. And it forms a little narrow slot between the middle turbinate and its medial mucosal surface, which is a recessus terminalis. And then the more anterior aspects of the frontal recess are lateral to the upper attachment of the uncinate. And I, I must confess, this is a concept when I first read about it in um, Professor Stamberger's textbook that caused me great confusion because I thought, aha, that means my entry into the frontal recess will be different if the uncinate attaches to the skull base as opposed to if it attaches to the lamina. And this is something that I must confess I struggled with for a bit. And here's a reason why I don't think it's too, too, too much of a struggle. Or well, at least I don't struggle quite as much as I used to. Frontal recesses are hard for goodness sake. Um, so here is a left frontal recess being dissected. And here here is the very top of the uncinate, and the bottom part of the uncinate has been removed. So you can see the bulla, and that little bit of blood is on the anterior surface of the bulla, and here's the middle turbinate. Now, if the uncinate were to go up and attach to here, you'd get a Cessus terminalis just on the inside here between the middle turbinate and the medial aspect of the uncinate. If, if it attaches over here, you wouldn't. And if it attaches at the top, uh, uh, again, you'd, you'd, you'd get a little recessus terminalis for what it is worth. But actually, it's not worth much because the reality is is that when you put your frontal sinus cica in, the frontal sinus cica is actually posterior to all of these attachments. And it goes in the same slot for just about everyone. And so here are, for what they are worth, my two rules. A célula de agnose, ou sempre vai passar póstero medial. E a segunda regra é que a face frontal da bula sempre leva ao seio frontal. E olha, eu acho que essas regras, na verdade, são muito esquecidas e até. É, Sinoplasty, because the reality is, is a little sinoplasty wire gets to about here. It gets pushed superiorly, and it is the bulla which then guides the sinoplasty wire into the um, frontal sinus. So I think those are good thoughts to think. Okay, agonazi, what about all the variations, all these extra cells which, you know, get, get variously presented and, uh, frankly, uh, again, were for me a subject of significant confusion. I think if you think of the full science from the point of view of its anatomical derivation, then it becomes way easier because there are really only two structures in the frontal sinus. There's the uncinate, which is a derivative of the, of the first ethmo turbinal and a bulla, which is a derivative of the second. Now, the trick is that all these extra little cells which confuse us, like uh, the, the now called super agar cells, or Kuhn one in the, in the good old days, and oh, I've just lost my arrow on this one, unfortunately. N nonetheless, I don't think I need it. Um, 
you can see that simply that extra cell is just formed by a splitting of the unsinet. It's not, a, it's not an extra entity. It is the unsinet, uh, which has got a few little leaflets. And similarly, K2 cells or two super agar cells is, is just a couple of little leaflets from the unsinet. So the variations of the same fundamental anatomy, if you just keep, you know, the, the embryo, <coughs> excuse me, the embryological thought, that there are only two things and there's a pathway between them, you cannot go too far wrong. So we have, in this particular case, the agonazi and a K1 and a K2 cell. And if we look at that a little bit closely, you can see the little extra leaflets and you can see it's all one structure. And if you think of it as all one structure, that's a good thing because we really dissect it as all one structure. What happens when the unsinate goes a little bit further through the osteum, through the frontal osteum? We get a suprafrontal agacel according to the new classification. And that's a K3 or K4 cell according to the old classification, but that's simply all it is is the unsinet has grown through the frontal osteum to attach above the level of the beak. So how does this look on a sagittal view? You have your agonazi cell, the beak, the bulla ethmoidalis, the gran lamella, gran lamella from the third ethmoturbinal and the frontal recess. A super agar cell, if you have the little uh, extra leaflets from the unsinate, and a suprafrontal agar cell, if the unsinate goes through the osteum. And a K4 cell is just a really big one, um, uh, but it's, it's exactly the same principle. The absolute issue is that the position of the pathway and the point of access to the pathway never changes. Can we look at this now on the axial? So still on the left side, we're on the axial view, nasal stem, nasal lacrimal duct. The cell of the agonazi is posterior and a little superior to the nasal lacrimal duct, to the fundus of the duct. The middle turbinate the bulla ethmoidalis, the grand lamella, the frontal recess, and the pathway, posteromedial to the agonazi cell. So what do you do when you dissect? You take away the unsinate, and you take away the bulla. And, uh, and, um, and that's pretty much it. So how does that look in practice. Uh, I'm going to very quickly run through this. Uh, this is a sort of a pre-example, just, just while as a word is, is uh, fresh in uh, uh, our minds. Here is the unsinate forming the agonazi cell. And look, this is, this is actually not the best example in the world, unfortunately, because in this patient that you would think is a K3 cell, but it's not. That's actually the frontal intersinus septum. In this case, the, uh, oh, and again, I've lost my, my pointer, but in this case, the uh, agonazi goes up and attaches to the skull base. Um, the septum should be there, but it's just a little bit moved over in this case. And that's where our little pathway is, with the unsinate and the bulla on view. So how does that look endoscopically, or how does it look sagittally? Agonazi space, bulla, ground lamella behind it. So here we are operating on the left side, ball probe, fracturing the superior part of the unsinate, going right up into the volume of the cell of the agonazi, and then removing it. And look, there are many ways to remove this. So, uh, I quite like the microtebrider. There is an absolute caveat, and that is you must be able to see Zomed at all times, 
which means that your gait is vertical. You do not want to rotate your gait laterally because it's really easy. The lamina is just here. So that needs to be absolutely on your mind all the time. And you can see now that that's frontal recess. That's the top of the unsonant there, the bulla behind. We go posteromedial and we're into the frontal sinus. And the next step is just to use the 55 curette to fracture the tiny pieces of bone and try to remove the tiny pieces of bone without damaging the mucosa. And then the next step is simply to, again, with the 55 degree curette, go behind the bulla and remove the bulla uh, as far superiorly as possible, which is right against its attachment to the skull base. And that's where we are now. That is the frontal sinus. That's the attachment of the, of the bulla, the top of the bulla. And the, the attachment of the unsonate is up here. And that's basically, that, that's, our, that's our cell. That's our dissection of the frontal recess. So what I'd like now to do um, is to um, talk a little bit about how, it, uh, how the process of FES goes sequentially. Um, and this is, a, I'd like to present a case. This, this, this case actually happened, Camilla, um, immediately after our phone call. This is the next case I did because Camilla said, why don't you, why don't you video a fess and, and uh, I will edit it for you. So all of these edits, are, uh, and I'm very grateful, were done by Camilla over the weekend. Um, and they were sent back to me and I put them together um, in a sort of step-by-step -step thing. So um, some ergonomic things. The patient on the table, the anaesthetist on the opposite side to the surgeon, the surgeon uh, towards the patient's head fairly clearly. Now, this is something that I don't think many people do, but I must say, I, I, I changed three or four years ago, I think, to this setup, and I really like it having my nurse immediately to my left. But I think the absolute key thing is the position of the screen. And we have two screens. This is theater four at Gillies, um, Camilla, if it looks vaguely familiar. Uh, we have two screens. Number one is the video screen. And I think the advantage of having it, having the nurse to your left is your nurse has an identical view on the same screen that you have. But what I really like is it sets your shoulders and your neck in a neutral position. I have the screen relatively high, so I'm not looking down on it, but rather looking up on it. And all of this, frankly, is because all my musculoskeletal system is aging. And if I do this, I get through a day's work without aches or pains, and I think it is far less fatiguing. Many setups have the screen further beyond, further up the, um, the patient's head. And uh, that involves twisting of the spine. Ergonomically, I, I personally find this a much easier system. And we've got another um, television screen, large screen on the wall, which our anaesthetists or the circulators, uh, circulating nurses are easily able to view. So that when you start moaning, as we all, I suspect, often do about the uh, quality of the field, then the anaesthetist goes, yes, it is a little bit red, isn't it? And, and we'll fix it for you. Now, here's the key. Here's, the, here's our um, anaesthetic team. This is just me filming from where I sit for what it is worth. And it, uh, I went a little bit quickly over the blood pressure, but the systolic was 86, the diastolic was 55, and the heart rate was 55, I think. And I think that's ideal. If you can get systolic around about 90 for those patients who can tolerate it, and if you can get a heart rate below 60, I think there is little doubt that the field is better. Our anaesthetists generally achieve that with Teva. Uh, they use, and you can see here, that is remifentanil and propofol, propofol infusion. That is not to say that perfectly good fields can't be, can't be achieved with inhalationals, 
but I think keeping the MAC a little bit low and using other things. Remy fentanyl infusions are fabulous because they also induce bradycardia. Um, that's just looking to my left. That's where the nurse is with her gear, which she is preparing. And, uh, and that's looking upwards to the screen. You can see the screen is directly over the patient and a little bit upwards so that uh, I've got some lumbar uh, lordosis and uh, the um, CT scan. So here's, here's the case. It starts with the application of neuropathies. I put the neuropathies on uh, when the patient's asleep and I do that so I can do it with the endoscope. And uh, I think there is some advantage to that because uh, I feel as if the placement is better. And I, I actually started doing that because I used to take, uh, well, I still do often take biological samples um, swabs before packing and so it's best to do those obviously with the endoscope but what I found was how quickly um, cocaine and adrenaline and bicarbonate work now I'm not sure if cocaine is available for you but it's a fantastic vasoconstrictor particularly if you add a little bit of bicarbonate in because the pKa of cocaine is 8.4 <clears throat> so if you make a solution slightly alkaline it um, it works better. If you use adrenaline alone, I would, I would recommend one in a thousand and not diluting it too, too, too much because it, it, and it works fabulously so long as it's not too diluted. So I then uh, apply some local anesthesia. Um, an out fracturing of the inferior turbine allows access to where I'd like to inject. That's bupivacaine. I use bupivacaine as opposed to lidocaine or xylocaine because it lasts for so much longer. And I think the patients are more pain-free in recovery in the first few hours. Now, I have no data to support that, but that's an impression that I get uh, with adrenaline 1 in 80,000. And I inject that um, in the region of the vertical part of the palatine bone below where I think the sphenopalatine artery is, so I don't inject it intra-arterially, and on the agonazi. So what I'm trying to do is anesthetize and vasoconstrict the nerves and the blood vessels, which come through the sphenopalatine foramen, and similarly the anterior ethmoidal artery and nerves, which come down through the or from the anterior ethmoidal foramen. So here's the anatomy of this particular patient, which is a 27-year-old patient. She has frontal sinusitis on her CT scan. She has very simple frontal anatomy. There's her uncinate forming the agonazi cell. We go a little bit further back, and then we see the volume of the bulla. We there see the little um, protrusion of the anterior ethmoidal artery and posterior ethmoidal. And you can see she's got not particularly severe disease, but she has a radiologically proven disease of the frontal recess and ongoing symptoms. And so for such a patient, I would do a full house or comprehensive fess, including frontal sinus dissection. So uh, the first step is an antonectomy. And I actually, confess to really liking a sickle knife because the sickle knife is such a fine instrument. It gets into the middle meatus easily and it's got that lovely blunt superior surface which can medialize the middle turbinate. And I make the incision, as you can see, between the posterior part and the superior part of the uncinate, which is where the natural ostium is. The natural ostium will be just through there. To remove the uncinate off the inferior conchal bone, I do. Uh, now, I don't know. Post, postage stamping, I don't know if that is a term in Portuguese. I hope, um, Marcelo, that's not a difficult uh, thing to translate. But when you, when you make an incision by making a whole lot of little tiny holes, it's, it will, will, we certainly call it postage stamping in English. And so it's postage stamping removing the little tiny protrusions of bone from the inferior surface of the uncinate bone off the inferior conchal bone. And then with the ball probe with the big end, um, just fracturing 
the bone of the superior part of the unsinate off its attachment to the lamina. The reason why I like fracturing is because with fracturing, the bone tends to break at its point of attachment and you don't have little parts left behind. You can see the whole lot comes out. If you do this with a 45 degree through cutter, as I think has been the traditional way, certainly all of our 45 degree through cutters are too blunt to cut mucosa nicely. And I always end, end up with a little rim of bone lateral. So this is why I quite like this technique. Um, I then remove the uh, uh, remaining part of the unsinate and fontanelle with the microdebrider. Again, the absolute importance of keeping Zomet in view. So the gate is vertical. You always want to be seeing what is going into the gate of your microdebrider because there is nothing which goes in faster than orbital fat. So we're left now with the very top of the unsinate, which you can see there, forming the volume of the agonizing cell, which is there. Posteromedial, that's where the pathway is. We're just going up the front face of the bulla posteromedially, and there is the pathway. And that's being gradually enlarged by fracturing with a 55 degree curette and that allows the removal of the bone and now you can see into the frontal sinus. The beak will be here, posterior table here, into sinus seven. So what's the next step? We've done ethmo terminal one, we've done the unsinate. Next step, do the bulla. 55 degree, enter the bulla medially, move the uh, head of the curette superiorly as far as it will go because it attaches a long way upwards. Remove the bone, again, trying to leave the mucosa. The mucosa is best dealt with by the microdebrider. And you could see then the anterior ethmoidal artery. Ah, there's a much better view. The anterior ethmoidal artery, and I'll just, ah, look, I'll stop that there. I'll just go back a tad if I can. Stop, because what you can see here is posterior table. The first septation that you will see is the top of the bulla. Then you have uh, Stamberger's clear area, the space between the bulla and the anterior ethmoidal artery and ground lamella. And it's clear. It's clear for two reasons. Reason one is for whatever reason it seems to in, uh, not develop much muc uh, 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 mucosal inflammation. I don't understand that. But reason number two why it's clear, and it always seems to be a bit brighter, is because of the angle of the skull base. And that's going vertical, and it's going through a, a curve at this point before it then goes and forms a horizontal fovea ethmoidalis. And why that's brighter at the moment, that, at that point, is because it's angled perpendicularly to your scope, and therefore more light is reflected. And it's exactly like why we get a light reflex when we when we look at um, at uh, eardrums or tympanums. Um, so we then go backwards. We go through the uh, middle turbinate at its point of attachment or, or the point of uh, angle between the superior part of the uh, ground lamella and its horizontal part. And then we find the posterior ethmoids behind the ground lamella. And uh, removing that to give us plenty of space. And you can see now the fovea, you can see clearly the anterior ethmoidal artery, which in this case is a little bit anterior to the attachment of the ground lamella, often that artery is actually in the root of the ground lamella. Stamberger's clear area, remnant of bulla. Oop. And I've just gone backwards. Now, that's the, and that's the uh, 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 maxillary sinus. The top of the maxillary sinus is at the same level as the sphenoid ostium. The instrument that I like to enter the sphenoid ostium in with is, is the freer. The superior turbine at its lower edge is then reduced. If you can retain some superior turbine, it may well help 
with retrograde olfaction in the patient's enjoyment of his or her dinners afterwards because there's a lot of retrograde olfaction which is believed to happen there. Sphenoidotomy is then completed or the soft tissue is removed with the microdebrider. I use a quad cut um, which blocks far less regularly than the tri cut. And then the Hyatt Koffler is a very safe instrument to remove the remainder of the um, sphenoid. You can see who taught me, can't you, Eldo? And uh, then we go put on a 45 degree, and now we can see beautifully into the frontal ostium, remove yeah, as I the, can. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, top of the uh, uncinate, the top of the bulla. That little part is often removed, and that uh, can, if it is retained, restrict the size of the ostium. So taking it right up to the skull base is a good idea. And uh, removing the little, little parts of the bone, the giraffe forceps become particularly helpful here. And the idea is to try to remove the bone, but leave as much mucosa in place as possible. Now, the next thing is slightly controversial. This is what I do to turbinates. And it's brutal because there's not much left at the end. And all, all the empty nose brigade will be drawing a deep breath as they see this. And they'll say, oh my goodness me, you're going to cause empty nose syndrome. Um, which it doesn't. Um, certainly not in New Zealand. We're at ground level, sea level, and it's temperate. Um, and we have terrible rhinitis. I suspect all of those um, factors are at play in Brazil. And this is a very good way of making patients have a clear nose for the rest of their life. You must remove the bone so that there's not bone protruding. Now, I then put in a bulge suture. Everyone who gets a comprehensive fist gets a bulge suture. It is a PS2 needle with a 4-0 vicral repeat, and it's forced through the middle turbinate, comes out the other side, and then uh, it goes through again. Oh, there's, oh uh, there's a little knot, and... Uh, it goes through again, and then a quilting suture to um, bring the two layers of the septal mucosa together. Now, packing. Nobody knows how to pack a nose because um, there are so few really good comparative data from studies saying one is definitely better than the other. I use what we call in theatre the fat T, which is a 10 by 10 centimetre piece of silastic. It's got two little, um, and I'm, I might just, because it was a little bit quick, I will show you the shape again. So it's fat T, there's a f um, the wider bit, two little um, uh, tabs, one of which goes into the sphenoid there, and the other one protrudes forward of the anterior margin of the middle turbinate. And the unfurling provides a uh, just enough tension to keep there that doesn't need to be stitched and none so far and I put in a lot of these none so far have been dislodged I'm pleased to say and it just sits there um, now this is a relatively new product it is the new version of surgery cell it's called blood stop it's made of carboxymethyl cellulose um, it's very very sticky and the only way to manipulate it is actually with a, a saline being squirted through an 18 gauge. And I'll show you, it forms a, this glorious jelly and it really has reduced my post-operative bleeds, I think. And then I just put some hydrogel. It's lubricating jelly, for goodness sake. Um, just really to make everything as filled with things that aren't blood as possible. And that, of course, doesn't last for very long. <clears throat> there you can see the blood stop covering the um, 
uns uh, the turbinectomy, which actually in reality, once it's done, doesn't look that much different from a turbinoplasty. And you can see that I've used monopolar cautery to cauterize the inferior conchal artery. <clears throat> So but that is the end of the procedure, for goodness sake. What do I do postoperatively? I give everyone prednisone. The reason for that is that patients' mucosa swells, irrespective of whether it's CRS with or without polyps. Also, patients feel a bit knocked around for the first week or two. A little bit of prednisone makes them, I think, feel better. So I give them 20 milligrams for one week, 10 milligrams for one week. I give them doxycycline daily for two weeks. I do that because I think it reduces crusting. I have no data for that. I go through periods where I don't do that because my infectious diseases physicians are slightly horrified that I do do it. I think it is better to give some post-operative antibiotics because I think the cavities look better. I sinus rinse, or I suggest my patients do, a lot initially. The initial uh, regimen is four bottles four times daily. So that's 16 bottles a day, which is a lot. They don't do that for more than the first week. But it just means that the blood and crust are removed as quickly as possible. So also, it means that the nose is kept as humid as possible. And this is where I like xylitol. Xylitol, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a five carbon sugar which we can't absorb and which bacteria can't absorb and in fact biofilms don't like very much which is a humectant it absorbs water rather than being drying as salt solutions are drying on the nasal mucosa and a lot of patients really like it it's very inexpensive it's about in new zealand dollars which uh, so if i give you a price it's about 20 us dollars a kilo and it's readily available from health food stores so uh, I'm, I'm a big xylitol fan and fluticasone spray and i'm going to talk a little bit about various ways of giving topical steroids in a moment and the addition of budesonide to the sinus rinse and i think that that is a good thing and increasingly over the last little while i've been using that more and more it's not an efficient way of getting the drug in, but I think it gets it into dark corners that you don't get it into with um, a, a, a standard sprays. I get the patient back at a week. I do a debridement. I remove the silastic splint. The nice thing about the silastic splint and the hydrogel is it keeps the ethmoid remnant moist because the last thing I think we want is uh, uh, hard clot and crust in the ethmoid. Now, um, here's my here's my here's my only invention. Um, it's actually it's just a 3D printed nasal adapter. It goes onto the end of a multi-dose inhaler, and that means that you can puff uh, flixotide or, or, or fluticasone for asthma up a nose. Now you're thinking, why do that? And there's a simple reason. It's all about particle size and velocity. The particles that come out of a multi-dose inhaler are significantly smaller. They're probably a third or a quarter of the size than the uh, particles that come out of a standard nasal spray. Nasal sprays were developed to treat allergic rhinitis. All you need to do is get the topical steroid onto the inferior turbinate head. What we want to do is spray spray everywhere in a big volume. And so we want as much help as we can with diffusion. And this is a very comfortable way of putting topical steroid up your nose. You don't have any residual. You can't feel it. You don't have a residual of solution to swallow, which you do with nasal sprays. Um, and so I, uh, I'd be very happy if anyone wishes to have that 3D printed. I've got, I've got, as it were, all the data I can send that to you. Now, um, oh, and this is, this, is, this is Joey's work, Camilla. Um, I have a PhD student who's been doing a lot of work with computerized fluid dynamics and modeling how you get drugs to the 
cavity because I think this is the key. The two ways that we can reduce recurrence are to do big operations and get everything open so that we can then get drugs into them. Nasal sprays, standard nasal sprays were not designed for this action. This is why we need to be a bit more inventive. So the MDI, the multi-dose inhaler, the asthma multi-dose inhaler is one way. And here's another way. Oh, look. yeah. Um, oh, hang on. We don't need volume. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> we're going to get volume because if I turn the other, oh, look, I will. Oh, I'll turn that volume off. I'll just, I think I might be turning. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Good. All right. Sorry. That was me directing um, Jenny, who was the photographer. So that's just adding 10 puffs of budesonide to a sinus rinse before adding xylitol. The xylitol dose, uh, I give this away in these little um, containers, and these are very small plastic teaspoons, and the dose is three. And that gives you an osmolality, which is about the same as the typical half teaspoon of salt or sachet of sinus rinse. And then uh, I use warm water out of a tap. Now, um, water's pretty clean here. So warm water out of the tap is good. If you're worried, obviously, about your water source, then it's a good idea to boil it and uh, give it a really good shake. The problem with xylitol is that it does not dissolve quite as easily as salt does, so it needs to be shaken a little bit more. And that is everything I know about sinus surgery, for goodness sake. And I don't quite know how long that took. I hope that's about the right length of time, Camilla, because yes. I can now hear you. My yeah, okay. that, there was, a, in some way, my sound got muted, but it's good. Now, um, I'd absolutely deli be delighted to hear what you think um, about anything. First of all, I'm going to start um, just asking you about Drive Tree because I know that you guys in New Zealand and Australia, you do a little bit more than us here in terms of the number of patients that you um, take in consideration for Drive Tree. But I want to specifically ask you to how often you uh, would recommend a Drive Tree as a primary procedure. Miller, these are great questions. And like, which criteria you use to yeah. just... Uh, absolutely. A a a absolutely. There are no hard and fast rules. When and how often you use draft three depends a little bit about when and how often you use draft three. The reality is, is that the more you do it, the less of an issue it is the safer it feels in your hands and the faster it goes. And so perhaps as you do more, your threshold for doing them is reduced. In answer to your question, when to do it for revision cases, if the patient has had his or her frontal recess dissected, but has recurrent disease because the size of the ostium, which has been achieved, with the frontal recess dissection is not big enough to maintain patency given the degree of mucosal disease, so you get occlusion, that patient will get a, a draft three. And I, think that, I don't think there's much argument about that. And that's why it's great for rhinologists to feel comfortable with that procedure because that's the thing that you can offer, offer over generalists, when, when a generalist has done the frontal dissection, they have recurrent disease, you do a draft three. Is there a role for primary draft three? Yeah, I think that absolutely is. It depends a little bit on the patient. If there are patients who have got very, very big beaks, which then narrow the frontal ostium, that situation in association with very bad disease, the patients, for example, with SAMTA's triad, um, and you think that the rate of recurrence, the possibility of frontal sinus recurrence in this patient is sufficiently high that I think it's not an unreasonable thing to do a draft three, because the reality is, is that if you do a reasonable number of draft threes, the actual technical or, or time demands of that procedure 
over a frontal dissection are not so great. Um, and so I think in that case, uh, uh, or cases like that, I would be very happy to go to a primary draft three. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Felipe, Dr. Felipe Marconato, do you have any questions? Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, at first, I, I would uh, I would like to congratulations, Dr. Richard, for this excellent presentation, and I want to say thank you for Dr. Aldo and Camila for inviting me. My question is about the Miriam turbinates. Uh, here in Brazil, yeah. some surgeons performed this at the beginning of the surgery. Yeah, but no part of us uh, care about to conserve them. Uh, when do you think it's necessary to approach them? Yeah, look, I think that's a really, really great question. There are some patients who have got massive middle turbinates because they've got big concha bullosi in their middle turbinate. Removing the lateral side, which I tend to do, I like to microdebride them away because I think you can remove it with putting as little torsion on the remaining middle turbinate so the remaining middle turbinate remains reasonably stable. Uh, I think that's a no-brainer, removing concha. The, some patients have got a bulbous end, and in fact, many patients have got a bulbous anterior end to their middle turbinate. And increasingly, I think that removing part of that bulbous end, just with a through-cutting uh, 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 forcep, going from the top, going down to the bottom, and removing three or four or five millimeters of the bulbous end is a really good idea. Your point about that being done early in the procedure is one that you can debate. If you remove a concha early in the procedure, I think there's no doubt it makes the procedure easy to do. If you remove the bulbous end, yes, it may do give you a little bit more access. The difficulty though, is you've then got a cut and bleeding edge just at the point where you want to put the endoscope. So sometimes it may, sometimes it, it may not. I think actually, quite a good time to do that. I quite like to keep that mucosa intact until the end and then take a few millimeters off. I think generally preserving middle and superior turbinates as much as is reasonable is a good idea because I think there is a, it is likely to improve olfaction postoperatively. Keeping them stable with bulger sutures, I think is a really good idea because I think that the combination of removing that bulbous anterior head and making sure that they don't medialize with a bulger suture and not frankly, certainly in my hands, I must confess, bulger sutures help, but they're not a guarantee, um, improves access of topical medication into the middle meatus postoperatively. And I think that's a really important um, thing to be able to achieve. Um, so those are, those are all the sort of things that go through my mind about middle turbinates. I agree. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so now Dr. Fabio Pina, do you wanna have any, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Aldo, for the invitation. Dr. Camila, it's another being here. Congratulations for your wonderful lecture, Richard Douglas. Um, let me ask you something about, you, you mentioned a, a brilliant, uh, um, on your PPT presentation about um, fluidodynamics, computed fluidodynamics. Yes, from yes. Our, from, from our accent. And yeah. um, I'm... Um, uh, recently, I've read a paper from, I guess it's from Kingston's Dr. Choi, that his, their group has shown that uh, if they, uh, uh, they have compared uh, draft three with yes. another kind of, uh, of frontal approach, where it's a, it's a, a mix of uh, uh, frontal 2B and, yeah. and three. They, they, the only difference is that they, they do not remove the interceptum from the interceptor. Yeah. And then they have shown that, that uh, in, in your post uh, op uh, drug deliver that uh, it, uh, by the fluid dynamics in, in computed fluid dynamics yeah. uh, with this outcome that they have uh, uh, pretty the same uh, 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 
results yeah. or um, uh, yeah. of, uh, of regarding fluid dynamics. Yeah. So, uh, in the end of the, uh, the uh, in the conclusion, they uh, they say that due to the time consuming, it's yeah. uh, advisable to perform yeah. this kind of 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 uh, surgery with uh, with uh, with wood take uh, less time less mm. of time so uh, i'm really um, i'm really uh, i was very thoughtful about this paper and uh, mm. uh, do you think that this is if you are familiar with this kind of uh, of measure for the dynamics mm. do you think that this could be a, a sort of a way for uh, not doing a, such a long surgery and, and yeah. at the same time delivering drug to the front of yeah time. yeah uh, look, uh, yeah no I, I I understand the principle that you're you're you are talking about um, all of our modelling of where airflow and drugs go to and it doesn't matter how sophisticated your model is it's a model and it's actually really, really difficult to work out in reality in a patient where the drugs go. And people have tried with dyes, I've tried, tried with radioactive label drugs. We're actually, we're, we're developing a system now, and again, Camilla, this is Joey, of putting um, um, little filter paper dots and um, giving the patient fluticasone and then removing the dots from various parts of the sinuses and then actually doing uh, a um, liquid chromatography to work out the concentration of the drug. They are all difficult. Um, they are all approximations. Um, and everything that we do helps a little, but is not the panacea. Um, the the thing that I, I must confess I'm becoming increasingly convinced by is topical steroids in sinus rinse. And I wasn't actually a big convert, but increasingly I am. We know when we rinse, we know a few, we know a few things that I think are fairly, that th these are oh, not quite axioms, but I think there's good data. We know two things with sinus rinse about 95% of it comes straight out. So it's an extremely inefficient way of, of adding the drug. So if you put in 1,000 micrograms of butesonide, you can at best hope that 50 micrograms stays. So, you know, that's not much. But we also know that if you do a draft three, that the access of the sinus rinse to the frontal sinus is good. So that what I think you, you, we have with that technique is a way of getting a small amount of topical steroid into the frontal sinus that we don't have with any other way at the moment, uh, unless we directly inject it there um, or instill it there. So um, I, I confess that I am a draft three proponent and again, that reflects who trained me, but it also reflects the fact that the more you do, the less of an imposition they are to do, um, the less your patients are, uh, are knocked around by the procedure. And it, it, there is more morbidity with the draft three. I think of that, there is no doubt. It takes a little longer to heal up, but I think it is a very, very helpful procedure in the hard patients. Thank you. All right, and Dr. Marcio Nakanishi. First of all, thank you, Professor Aldestan, for this kind invitation. Thank you, Camila, for chairing this webinar. And thank you, Professor Richard Douglas, for your outstanding lecture. Yeah. Uh, regarding the concept of the precision medicine, because we we we're supposed to talk in, about precision medicine yeah. in your presentation. And but fitting this concept to the yeah. FES, like the 4P concept, like prediction, prevention, participation, and personalized medicine, this 4P yeah. concept. Yeah. Do you think that this concept can be applied to the FES? Yes. Um, I, look, I think that's an absolutely fascinating question. And um, the, uh, the last talk I gave, which was actually, uh, it was a webinar for the Australian Society of ORL, and it addressed this, absolutely this question. 
about what is the impact that phenotyping or endotyping has on our clinical decision making. And um, if I can cut to, to, to the last slide on a 20 minute talk, um, I'm not sure at the moment that we're actually very good at doing phenotyping or endotyping in a way that enables us to make binary decisions. Because people say it's eosinophilic or it's not eosinophilic, but uh, the absolute reality is, is there's a whole lot in the middle. And you don't, we aren't absolutely so clear <clears throat> that it's only the eosinophilics who respond to topical steroids and it's only the non-eosinophilics who respond well to macrolides. And in fact, in asthma, the Japanese would suggest it's quite the opposite. There is a great deal currently of confusion, I think, in our literature. Or when I shouldn't, I shouldn't say confusion, there is, there is lack of clarity. How that boils down to, what, to the way I treat patients is, I must confess, given that we have in New Zealand very limited access to biologicals, and I think nearly always it's able to, we are able to make with the tools at hand, sinus is better without recourse to biologicals, that the surgery, that the medical treatment that I give to CRS with and without nasal polyps is pretty close to identical. Um, everyone gets a comprehensive or a full house vest who has got frontal sinus disease, irrespective of whether that's secondary to polyps or not. Everyone gets prednisone postoperatively. Everyone gets topical steroid postoperatively because there is mucosal inflammation and whether that mucosal inflammation forms edematous polyps or not, it is still inflammation. And so in answer to your question, and you can see, you can see what I, I do in my brain. It's, it's, what it's trying to do is make complicated things simple so that I can, I can operate on a, a daily basis and make things clear to me, clear to my trainees, clear to my patients. Um, and so the reality is, is that I don't treat them differently. Um, now, that may change when medications like dupilumab uh, stop costing 30,000 US per annum um, and are more freely available. Um, but as it stands at the moment, I must confess I'm, I'm a tiny bit of a, an anti-phenotyper, anti-endotyper until we have better data which suggests that the endpoints are different if you treat patients according to their phenotype or end, endotype. Yes, thank you. But uh, I would like to, to yeah. ask you if the phenotyping or endotype in the patient can change your surgical procedure. Yep. Um, and, and the answer to that is most of the time, no. The severity no. does, unquestionably. But whether it's because of polyps, or non-polyps, or whether it's eosinophilic or non-eosinophilic, the reality is, is that I would do the same operation for the same operation. Lund Mackay, as it were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And 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 I, I'm entirely entirely open to the concept that I'm really wrong, um, okay. but but I'd like to see strong data to suggest that I am. Uh, you know, that there is a better way of doing it, that, that you can, as it were, tailor an operation because the patient has got polyps or tailor an operation because the patient's uh, intensely eosinophilic. I'm not sure we're there at the moment. Yes, the second question is, you showed in a very clear video in dissecting the roof of the skull base. Mm. Uh, we know that the dissection of the ethmoid roof is the most critical point yes. to identify the limits. What yeah. is your tip to give to residents and fellows to avoid the CSF and yes. at the same time dissect the entire roof. Yeah. Not left yeah. in any, any polyps or yes. any yeah. partition there. Yeah. What is your tip to give them? You yeah. showed that you told that it's like a eardrum and you showed yeah. the, the perpendicular yeah. uh, yes. view. But what is yeah. your your tip the to dissect? Thing, yeah. Look, way? look, I, 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 thank you for that question. The key thing I think about safety 
in dissection of the region of the fovea ethmoidalis is to do a sphenoidotomy. The, mm. the reason why I think sphenoidotomy is so important, yeah, is that when you go right to the top, when you go right to the attachment of the front face of the sphenoid to the skull base, that is always at the skull base. So you've defined the, the, the skull. Absolutely. The other thing that, um, and what we generally do, and I didn't do quite so much because that really wasn't a posterior ethmoid concentrated case, as it were. And as you'll see, and this is, look, I, I present that case with an apology insofar as that young patient had got better. That, you know, there was, there was disease in that CT scan which was taken a few weeks before, that had got better. And so that was almost normal anatomy. Most of my cases don't look like that. Um, it was clearer, but that was to, as it were, expose the anatomy clearly. Um, when I come forward from the sphenoid to remove the septations of the posterior ethmoid, I think in my own brain, and I inform the fellows and the trainees to, with the curette, drift laterally, gently against the lamina. Drift towards the lamina. Don't drift medially towards the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate. Um, because I, in my experience, that's where most of these happen, is that they, uh, surgeons are taking the septations off and they have it in their mind that they want to stay absolutely in a sagittal plane and unfortunately if you stay absolutely in the sagittal plane and are a little bit medial then you come increasingly in contact with anteriorly with the lateral lamella of the cribriform and unfortunately the point you come in contact with is where the artery enters the lateral lamella absolutely the thinnest and most vulnerable yes. point I um, so i think yeah come just come a little bit of, this is okay. this is great this is okay. this is this is why talking with brazilians is always so fast last question i would like to do is uh, your last uh, slides that you showed uh, the fluticas on spray using yes. for asthma i liked a lot and the rationale seems to be very good and do you have any study regarding this? No, no, uh, uh, I haven't. We've got CFD studies which compare the size uh, um, uh, and uh, part, the particles that come out are about 20 microns in size. The particles that come out of a standard flixinase spray are between about 50 and 100 microns. So they're a lot bigger. And um, we've got CFD studies we are at the moment with a, a, a group of, of bioengineers that we work with in Melbourne. They're producing some uh, casts, some 3D casts of, of post-operative sinuses. And so we will be doing some studies with casts and we are also going to be doing some studies with patients. And frankly, the way to do it is actually with patients and we will be using the little... Um, 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 filter papers placed strategically and just to see how much drug and so the advantage there is you can do it with a spray with a receptor patient and get them to spray six puffs in and then do it with an alternative and see whether the actual amount of drug you retrieve from a certain point is different um, but but pharmacokinetics pharmacodynamics in the nasal cavity is really hard. Is that, that's my experience of having battled away at it for a few years' time. Um, okay. But the, these are thoughts. These are thoughts. But I, I do know I get a bit of allergic rhinitis, for goodness' sake, and which is oh, it's the same season for you. Um, um, it's it's October to January in Auckland and February, and that's what I puff up my nose, and it's so much more pleasant to take than Flixinase spray. Okay, thank you very much. And the That's last one, here in Brasilia, I live in the middle part of Brazil, yeah. and it's a very, very yeah. dry region. Yeah. And mm. we, if I perform a turbinate yeah. Yeah. like you did, yes. I would have a very high level of complaint of yeah. my patient, I think. Yeah. 
is yeah. only a comment because here I don't know if in the shore side in our country they can they don't complain about taking the the turbinates like you showed. But yeah. This is what is my comment. It is an, it's a yes. as, as you told it's a controversial issue. Yeah, but yeah, I, I agree. In our experience, we 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 cannot taking. Mm. We yeah. operate, we do operate the turbinate and reduce the turbinate, but yeah. I think that for us here, I, especially the dry, I, yeah. we are very, very dry, almost a desert some people yeah. of the time. Yeah. And for this reason, we, we avoid taking out the turbinate like you did. In your I, 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 I'm totally sympathetic to exactly what you're saying. And that is why I, when, when I demonstrate that te technique, uh, look, I'm careful to say, that I think that you need to be aware of where you're practicing. However, it does, having said that, open the question of the empty nose syndrome. And Camilla and I have talked about this. She knows that my feelings about empty nose, uh, that uh, I think there is a very, very um, significant functional element to empty nose. Um, and the reason why I think of it, I'll be very interested, Eldo, who is probably, probably in, the, in, in reality created more empty noses insofar as I don't mean empty nose syndrome. I just mean sinonasal cavities or anything in them because you've taken everything up because it was filled with tumor. And I'd be very interested in your, your experience and your feeling about how many of these patients having had these large operations and very often then having their remaining cyanonasal mucosa irradiated. I'd be very interested yes. in your, your feeling about what the patients say, because I must say, and again, I'm at sea level in a temperate environment, but mine come back and they say, hmm, after the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, and it will take three months for all of this to settle down, for goodness sake. But they come back and they say, hmm, yep, no, I've breathed pretty well through my nose, thank you. And, and you put your scope in there and there's nothing there. And you think, mm, I'm not sure about this empty nose syndrome. So look, a, 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 no, a controversial topic, always good for a discussion. Uh, but Eldo, please tell me what you think. If you're, if, if you're still there. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very controversial issue, yes. Richard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Extremely controversial. And, and yeah. uh, uh, of course, uh, for tumors, uh, when you remove the turbinates, it, it is the yeah. price of disease. Yes. It's, it's, it's something different from, from inflammatory disease, like you showed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you here in Brazil, you are very against uh, removing the total inferior turbinate, yeah. like a turbinectomy, for example. Yes. Uh, you prefer to use some turbinoplasty, especially yes. in patients with uh, inferior hypertrophy of turbinates. Yes. Uh, not removed completely, of course. Yeah. But the problem is not this problem itself. Yes. The patient with massive polypose, the people remove the inferior turbinate and preserve the polyps. Yeah. This is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem. Yes. I call yeah. this uh, removal yeah. of the normal tissue and preserve the disease. Yeah. So th 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 this yeah. is the problem. Yeah. So many people think that you remove total the inferior turbinate, you cure the patient with nasal polypose. Yeah. This is all. Mm, it's, a, no. it's amazing, something like this. No. So that, that's true, that's true that the patients with, uh, uh, for example, tumors uh, yeah. that you need to remove with turbinates, especially uh, for approach or clavus cordomo or, or, yeah. or even malignant yes. disease. Yes. Uh, you need to remove or some approach for esthesia neuroblastomas. So, so th this is the price. So yes. the patient presents a chronic cross inside the nose, especially after radiotherapy yes. for a long time. Yes. One year, two years, so yeah. it's a chronic patient. You, you, you put yeah. the patient with you and go yeah. on with the patient because yeah. it's, it's really a big problem. So yeah. this is the only, the only thing you, you, in your presentation, you show us many, many nice yeah. tips yeah. of this yes. operation. I yeah. really appreciate a lot. Post-operative yeah. care is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the suture that you did in your patient after operation especially the middle turbinate into the nasal septum is absolutely essential yeah. to open the space and to allow the yeah. medical topical yeah. med medicine enter inside the, inside the sinus. Yeah. 
the normal spray not entered inside the sinus, as you know. Uh, only douche, normally it, it, it would seem you can penetrate inside the sinus. So, uh, regarding inferior turbinate, it's of course, is, uh, I agree with you, Marcio. Yeah. Uh, especially, he lives in very dry city, a very dry region. So, if yeah. you remove the turbinates, you yeah. create a wide cavity with many crosses with immediate problem with the patients. Yeah. So, maybe, maybe you live in, 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 yeah. in New Zealand and Auckland and um, sea level. So, maybe maybe the situation is yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course, no. the patient spends some couple months to recovery and then go on. No, I totally, totally accept what you're saying. And I think that's a, a, a really sensible thing. Please, n none of you asked me to fly over to Brazil to provide an expert opinion. In a legal case, you're having removed the turbinates completely. We now have a definitive answer that we are going to be, that we're going to be, <laughs> we're going to be more conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I think the, 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 points that, the point that I would like to make, however, having done um, a lot of these cases, is that in certain circumstances, it, it, it is possible. And my goodness me, these patients breathe clearly. Whoops. Um, so uh, nonetheless, um, but I absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, accept everything that you say. And I think that is what you are providing to the um, audience is a very, very sound advice. Thank you very much. Um, and now, Tiago, do you have any questions? Yes, I have, I have some practical questions about the yeah. post-treating post-operative time, okay? Uh, first of all, how many times do you ask your patients to rinse the nose and how many milliliters? Uh, yeah, great question. Solution? Yes, yes. Look, my, my protocol is for four bottles of sinus rinse, which is about a liter, four mm -hmm. times a day for the first week. And the patients go, and so did the nursing, so did the nursing staff. They say, goodness me, that's a lot. And I say, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and they can use nasal mist or saline sprays in between. What I really like to do, what I think is what I think is helpful, is to keep the sinonasal cavity moist. I then do the debridement at a week and I remove the silastic and with the silastic comes out a lot of the crust and, and it does generally keep the ethmoid remnant um, fairly free of uh, blood and crust. And then the patients go down to four bottles twice a day. And I suggest that they do that for the first three to six months. And then they go down to as many bottles as they can tolerate or want to keep on doing indefinitely. My anticipation is that patients who have comprehensive or full house face procedures will be sinus rinsing and spraying every day indefinitely. Now, I absolutely recognize that there will be patients who won't do that. And I absolutely recognize that there will be patients who don't need to do that. But I have a feeling that if patients rinse in day and I tell them I have a rhyme I don't know if this will translate, but a rinse and a spray every day keeps your rhinologist at bay. Does that <laughs> translate? <laughs> Anyhow, I tell them that. They say, they say oh, yeah. yeah, okay, all right, actually, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Davis, actually, you only use Fuchikazon spray. You never use Budazonib. Ah, uh, yeah, now that's which, a really, really which, good question. And which the concentration of fluticasone that you yeah. are... Uh, 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 look, the, the particular fluticasone that we have is 50 micrograms. Do I, do, do I use budesonide? Yes, I use budesonide in the wash. Why? Because budesonide is a little bit more water-soluble than fluticasone, which is more lipid-soluble. If, if I'm prescribing sprays, do I use budesonide or fluticasone, I use fluticasone because the bioavailability of fluticasone is less. Is there any difference in efficacy? Zero. 
um, there is a theoretical reduction in the long-term safety between those two medications. Are there better medications? Yes, I think there are. There is um, mimetazone. Um, which unfortunately in our country we don't have, our, our government won't fund it because they say there's no really strong evidence saying it is better. I don't know. Do you have mimetazone spray in Brazil? Yes, we have Oxmax. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, and is that about the same price as the other medications or is it more expensive? I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. The Australians have it and the Australians love it and use it almost exclusively. The bioavailability of mimetazone is very, very, very low and it is water soluble. So I think, I, I think if we had that, that's probably what I would use. But I think fluticasone is a very good and very safe agent. And, and the last question, how do you prepare the xylitol? How do you prepare ah, the xylitol? Oh, look, xylitol, I am very delighted to tell you, needs no preparation. It is neat, concentrated, unadulterated. Um, and uh, I used to add a little bit of salt to it, but I, I, I stopped doing that. Um, it, it, no, it just, it's pure xylitol. Now, is that perfect? No, it's not. Some patients don't like it. Some patients find it stings more than the um, uh, commercially prepared sachets. Uh, and some patients don't like it because the little that runs down the back of your throat tastes sweet. It tastes like sucrose, even although it's not absorbed, but it, it interacts with our taste receptors like sucrose. And so you have a slightly cloying, sweet feeling in, your, in the back of your throat. Uh, younger patients tend to like it, older patients maybe not so much. Most of my patients, having said that, are very happy to take it. It is very inexpensive. It is very easy to put in. Uh, and it, it is less drying than having salt in your nose. And it does have a, um, a, a not a terribly powerful, but it does have an antibiofilm activity. Um, and I have had some patients where, and this is anecdotal, but a really, I think, quite remarkable improvement in crusts with the use of xylitol. So it, it's my go-to. Um, we, our, the, the Neomed product in New Zealand costs about 50 US cents per sachet. It is ridiculously expensive. And so I think that an alternative, which patients can use 16 bottles a day without it um, bankrupting them, is a, you know, is, is a good, uh, I don't want the cost of the medication or the solute to be a barrier to the patients using um, using it. So, uh, how many spoons of xylitol uh, in each? Uh, well, I use three, and it, that that gives you an osmolality of about four hundred. The the little teaspoon, uh, the plastic one, I provide this with to the patients because it's so inexpensive. You know, five hundred grams of xylitol costs virtually nothing, and I give it to them, and I think that indicates that I think it's a good thing, I hope. And then they go off and buy their um, uh, future supplies from, uh, from health food stores. Um, they are small, they're, they're quite small teaspoons. The reason for their being small is you've got to then get the xylitol into the neck of the bottle. And that is the, that's the sort of limiting factor for the size. So it's, it would be two standard teaspoons. If you use a standard teaspoon, what I then suggest the patients do is they either purchase or fashion out of paper or cardboard a little funnel to get the xylitol into the sinus rinse. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations for your exceptional lecture. Thank it you, thank you, it's very kind. It's very kind and of you, thank, thank you. I thank again Professor Aldisson to giving us the opportunity to give these yeah. international lectures to Brazil. Thank you, Professor Aldisson. Yeah. Um, Dr. Eduardo Makoto, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Camila. Thank you, Dr. Aldo, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to be here with Dr. Richard. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was a great lecture, as you, yeah. as you always do. Thank you. And I have two questions. Um, what do you think, Richard, about the, uh, the draft 2B? 
Di pa yun siya ah, preferred yes. draft choice. Yes. But my impression is that sometimes draft should be yeah. could be good. Yeah. Do you yeah. have do, do you have any specific indication for that? I think that's a really good question, and I must confess it's not a procedure that I do very often. the The reason for not doing it very often is the difference in diameter of the ostium at the end of a draft. 2B is is significantly smaller than it is in a draft three, and even with graphs and such like, it's really difficult not to lose some of your diameter. Well, certainly, when I do it, some of the diameter of the 2B, some of it gets lost. But the other issue is that the beauty, I think, of a draft three is that effectively, because you remove the intersinus septum, your right frontal sinus, should you lose the part of the 3B that the sort of the right is going through, it will drain across into the part of the ostium on the left side. And so you, you've, you've got a safety net, whereas if you do a 2B, you still only have one ostium for that hole because it can't for that sinus because it can't drain across because you've still got your intersinus septum intact given also that the instruments and the thing that just according to the 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 the, the economics of it the cost of it the real cost in new zealand is the cost of the drill and i imagine that is because we use we use the zomed system and i use uh, two drills. Oh, look, there is one technical thing. If you all are using the Zomed drill, there is a drill that I've started using, and I can't remember if I started using this when you were with us, Camilla. Was I using the 40 degree three millimeter bullet head? Yes. To, I was. That, yeah, yeah, for, for drill outs. Yes. That burr is, oh, I think it's fabulous. It makes drill outs easier. Uh, and it's a little, it's a three millimeter burr, so it's quite a small burr, but it's got a little bullet head and it's diamond. I do all my drill outs with diamond because the fluted burrs scare me because they go so fast. Um, and that one really, I think it makes it easier. So I use that drill and then to get the very front part of the B cart, I use a 70 degree. So that's about in US dollars, that's about 750 US dollars worth of drills in New Zealand for, to use those two drills. So that's what stops me from, because I think, oh, that's, that's quite expensive. Um, if I were to do a 2B, I'd still be using drills. And so I sort of think when you've got the expensive gear out, just do the little bit extra because you're nearly always doing these procedures for a revision. First, FES, it's okay, 80 to 90% chance of doing well, your 10, 15% revision rate. You've got to get them the second time. You don't want a third fess. You don't want your patients having a third fess. And so that's where I think, uh, that's why I just think for the revision, go for um, um, kicking the ball out of the soccer field. <laughs> If that's an appropriate illusion, yes. <laughs> we usually hit cricket balls out of. We'll say we'll hit a cricket ball out of the stadium, but I don't think that I don't think that would resonate with the current audience to the same degree. Okay, thanks. And uh, Professor Vilma uh, is uh, she's our former ENT Brazilian Association president. And she presents a brilliant lecture this morning about chronic urine sinusitis. And she talked about uh, topical uh, antibiotics uh, yes. in the postoperative period. Uh, do you use that? Do you have um, a specific indication for topical antibiotics? That's a really, really good question. Uh, the, uh, I must confess that the more that uh, my group and others study, the microbiome and how it changes in CRS and how it changes in the post-operative period and how it changes according to the antibiotics that we take, either orally or topically, um, the less certain I am about what to do. 
Um, there are a few fundamental things that I think are clear. The use of antibiotics postoperatively, I think, are different from the use of antibiotics preoperatively. It is a mucky, horrible, damaged field with um, ciliostasis that we have often induced with our surgery, uh, mucosal damage. It is a fabulous environment for bacteria to live in. Um, is it reasonable then to use antibiotics postoperatively? I think it is. The difficulty, the, my tiny concern with topical antibiotics is their distribution. And that favors the use of oral antibiotics. We've just done a study. Oh, and Camilla, this is Joey's study, and it was probably happening when you were there. Can you remember Joey's study when she gave patients orally doxycycline for a week and then roxith or roxithromycin for a week or nothing? Was that being done when you were there? Andrew Maybe not. And, 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 and then we measured the drug levels. Yes. All of these patients had doxycycline, roxithromycin, or nothing for a week. We took them to the theater. They all had chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. We took them to the theater to the standard sinus procedure. We took mucosa off the middle turbinate and mucus. We suctioned all the mucus we could out of the nose. We, we analyzed the drug levels in the mucus, in the, in the bulla, in the mucosa of the bulla, and in the blood. Drug levels in the mucosa, and in the blood, the same. Drug levels in the mucus were about 20%, between about 10 and 20%. <clears throat> the drug levels after steady state had obviously been achieved because these patients had been on the medications for a week. And so our commonly used oral antibiotics don't get into the mucus very well. So that's perhaps an argument for using topical medications. However, We've also done a series of studies, which we started 10 years ago after a, a, an initial report by um, um, the rhinologist in Geneva, Eldo. Uh, I'm having a senior moment for a second. John, um, Claude, uh, Geneva rhinologist, um, whose name I can't remember. Lacroix. 2000, Lacroix. Lacroix. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Lacroix published a paper in 2005 or 2006 where he identified Staphylococcus aureus in three patients who had in the epithelium, in the mucosal epithelium. And we did a lot of studies on this and we found, having looked really hard in a huge number of patients, we found in about 50% of patients, if you look hard enough, you can find intramucosal, and it's either in the epithelium or in the interstitium, intramucosal gram-positive cocci in about half of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. So you know, there's a huge amount more, and, that, and patients with cystic fibrosis, their mucosa is absolutely full of gram-positive cocci, absolutely full, every, virtually every one of them that we look at. So that would argue against perhaps using topical antibiotics because it may well be that in fact what we really, really need to do is get our antibiotics into the um, mucosa. Um, so uh, uh, can I answer your question saying I don't know? But there is one thing that I am doing now, which again, I think works, but I don't have data. So again, I present this with apologies, but it's an idea. Topical antibiotics are quite good for inducing resistance. Small amount of drugs given repeatedly to uh, you know, bacteria growing in biofilm, highly resistant population already. Infectious diseases physicians around the world don't really like us giving topical antibiotics, if the truth is known. There are, however, a couple of topical antiseptics that can be given, one of which is povidone iodine, and povidone iodine can be added to the sinus rinse bottle. And you don't need to have very high concentrations. If, if the patient can tolerate it, somewhere between about 5 and 10 mils of 10% povidone iodine gives a concentration of povidone iodine, which should have an antibiofilm effect, according at least to in vitro, 
biofilm sensitivities. But there's another product made by an American company called Oculus. It is called um, uh, Nasacin. And it is an extremely dilute solution. It's 70 parts per million of hypochlorous acid. So basically, it's bleach. And remarkably, that in vitro kills everything. It kills all bacteria, viruses, and fungi, pretty much known to man. Um, but remarkably, it's tolerated by the cyanonasal um, cavity sufficiently that you can take it. You spray it in. And I can assure you that all of these things I recommend to patients, I take myself, but you spray it in and you think for a, about two minutes after, you think, well, that's killing everything because you've, you can feel it. Um, but then it goes away and most patients can tolerate it. And for patients who have persisting crust in their nose, I use betadine or nasacin or a combination of betadine and nasacin with long-term oral antibiotics, which are culture-directed, but mostly for us, it's Staphylococcus, which fortunately remains mostly sensitive to simple antibiotics in New Zealand. And that's my combination, along with, as you can imagine, a huge deluge of sinus rinsing with xylitol. And for persisting crusting, that's, that's usually tends to work. Okay, great lecture, great. Uh, thank you for your kindness, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a pleasure to be with you all. So, Richard, now we're gonna ha I'm gonna make some questions from the audience, okay? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. A lot of questions about xylitol that I think- Yes, oh, good. <laughs> um, you already answered three, three, three yeah. spoons um inside the, the rinsing bottle right yes okay and someone is asking about dr yesilonki is asking about if you think that the heating produced when you are drilling the frontal recess if you think that interferes in the healing process and yeah. as you said you only use diamond burrs right i only use diamond burrs absolutely i i think that's a real issue if your irrigation is not optimal because as we have, I think all of us have turned bone black uh, with our, with our burrs. Um, I think, and I think this is the beauty and um, of burrs, which are self irrigating. Um, and I think that they're absolutely optimal or, or if you use burrs, which are not ensuring that your assistant um, uh, has a, um, a syringe and uh, it directs irrigation onto the point of the burr. And I think, uh, uh, I'm sure absolutely that that may well um, um, reduce healing. If, if you kill osteocytes and mucosal fibroblasts with the heat of the drill. Okay. Great. And um, if you have any experience with Propel, dissolvable sinus implant, no, not with Propel. Uh, I, I don't. Um, I did a study for a company, which is now called Lyra. I presented it uh, a year or so ago at one of the ARS meetings. It's a Propel-like variant, but at least according to the company, it, it, it's loaded with mimetazone. Um, it uh, releases mimetazone for significantly longer than Propel does. Um, and that seemed to work really well. We uh, uh, gave it to patients who had chronic rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. Uh, it liked the Propel stent. It stays in the um, middle meatus. It was a six month study. It was the part of the study that I was involved with was open label. Uh, the patients got quite significantly better. Their SNOT 22 scores on average got, I think about 25 points better. Now it was open label, but um, uh, they got worse when that, we, we took them all out at six months and there was a little tiny remainder. Um, and the, it was very clear from the pharmacokinetics, there was no drug left in the patients um, at the end of the six months, um, most of them then recurred. So I think, I really think there was quite good evidence. This has been published in IFAR. There was quite good evidence that um, that, that particular stent worked. Is that a, a, a sensible thing to do either preoperatively or putting um, these 
um, stents in the ethmoid or even the frontal sinus postoperatively, yes, I, I think that is a sensible and reasonable um, uh, way to be thinking. And um, uh, more data will obviously come out, but there is some quite compelling data uh, pre and postoperatively that these stents work. Great. Thank you. And um, what about using Jalfan on the middle meatus? I think that it was probably to avoid lateralization of the middle turbinate. Do you use that? Gel, uh, gel phone. Gel phone? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, the, the yes, I think that's a really good question because I think that you can divide dressings up into dressings that d dissolve and so you don't really need to keep them in or dressings which absolutely don't dissolve at all which you then obviously need to take out and having in reality i reckon i've tried just about everything everything that anybody's ever presented to me or i've heard about i've tried and generally i think i've, I've come down to silastic because you take it out the rate of adhesion if you use silastic for a week or so in the middle meatus is very 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 low my concern about the, the the 20 different products which are like gel foam or nasopore and it goes on and on and on is that they become infiltrated with blood and certainly you can suck them out but my concern is that which is left will provide a um, a, a superstructure for the formation of um, adhesions. And so I must confess, I, I'm not generally uh, a great fan of um, the ones which dissolve, although I can see, I can see the advantages and they're really easy to put in. But um, my concern is, is they, they may not completely disappear as advertised. And the last question is about just um, someone is asking uh, if you think that it's different, the position of the head, if it impacts on how your uh, nasal, uh, uh, your saline irrigation goes with the bottle. Yeah, yeah. look, and, and there's some really good cadaver studies on that. And the, the reality is, is that if you don't have your head forward, the volume of the sinus rinse goes back into the nasopharynx and then it becomes a sort of a coughing and a spluttering as it goes down into your pharynx. Leaning forward over the basin, I think, is a really good thing. I don't think you need to curl up in the, you know, praying to make positions or whatever, but I think leaning forward over the basin is, is good and it's hygienic because it doesn't go everywhere. And I also suspect that that probably uh, maximizes the amount of um, rinse that gets into the anterior ethmoid's frontal recess area. Great. Thank you, Richard. I think we are running out of time. Thank you again, Dr. Aldo. Any questions? Well, uh, just, just a, a last comment, uh, Professor Richard Douglas. Uh, did you see any middle ear infusion after continuous irrigation of your nasal cavity? Middle I'm ear infusion. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Aldo. And it's young men. Because what young men do is they squeeze their bottle. They think, oh, my nose is blocked. I know how I'll fix that. I'll give it a really good squeeze. Because obviously all of that pressure is exerted on a... Um, variably patent um, um, uh, ostium to the uh, eust of the eustachian tube, and absolutely sinus rinse can. What can you do if patients really do have a patchless eustachian tube, and even with very gentle and sensible rinsing, they t tend to get water in their ears? Well, I think there are one or two things that can be helpful. There are other devices and sinus rinse have got their sinu gator, uh, which is a little powered device, which gives a, an agitation rather than a big flush. And I think that's a, that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. There's also the neti pot from Neomed again, 
which is it doesn't have pressure beyond gravity, and that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, so I think these are these are ideas. If patients really, really have eustachian tube um, patency, which um, sinus rinse overcomes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's I think it's, it's time to to finish. Unfortunately, yeah. it's almost two hours. Uh, it was a yeah. great talk. Uh, Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your talk. It's it's uh, with many many useful tips. It's very important for us. Thank and, you. And uh, my best regards and my best wishes to you and your family in this pandemic yeah. time. Thank you. Uh, I like to thank you so much to Brazilian ENT Society for support us, the Brazilian Academy of Phrenology as well. Uh, our institution, Hospital with the Mundo Vasconcelos, and uh, Camila, now a double function, uh, moderator and, and coordinator of her uh, live streams. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Marcelo uh, from Gravação, uh, from Belo Horizonte. Uh, he did a wonderful, a wonderful job. So perfect simultaneous translation. Uh, thank you so much and, and hope you count with you for others uh, live stream you, you will schedule. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, Thursday evening, six o'clock again, you have another uh, uh, talk, another, another live stream with two great guys, uh, Professor Ricardo Cajal and Professor uh, Daniel Prevedello, one ENT, another guy is a neurosurgeon, uh, both from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, talk about evolution of the school base and future perspectives. So, thank you for the, the panelists to join us tonight. Uh, with a great passion, with a great participation, I really, really appreciate. And thank you so much again, Professor Richard yeah. Douglas, uh, for your great participation and accept our invitation to be part of our series of uh, cough talks. Thank you so much, and and see you very soon. Thank, thank, thank you, you Aldo. It's been, been an absolute pleasure. Uh, lovely to see you. And can I pass on my warmest regards to all of you and to all of you in Brazil from New Thank Zealand. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I really appreciate you. it. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Lovely to see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.